As I sat to prepare this message on January 20, 19, 2017, <coughs> my memory recalled January 20, 2016. One year ago, a family of six woke up, packed suitcases into a, in an empty house, and loaded together in a minivan to journey across the country to start a new adventure for God. We had mixed feelings going on inside of our hearts. The community of the last 10 years where two of my children were born and where four of my children started school was in many ways the only home my children knew in their lives. Saying goodbye was hard to friends and church members who in many ways were the only family we had in British Columbia. But we also were filled with expectation and a nervous excitement of what God had planned for us ahead. The strong faith, at times faltering, that God was leading us helped us to get into that minivan a little over a year ago. It was least this way for Marion and I. The kids might have felt that mom and dad were dragging them away from their friends that they had grown up with. Have you ever felt like you are starting over? Not knowing what to expect or how you're ever going to be able to start over. I'm going to do something a little unique here at St. Paul, so I ask you to bear with me. But I ask that you turn to someone around you and share a time in your life where you felt like you were starting over, where it was a new adventure for you and you didn't know what was lying ahead and how you were going to get through it. Okay? So take just about a minute. I think it's amazing when we think about how all of us, a lot of us, I would say, have experienced in some way or another that feeling of starting something new or being afraid or fearful of what lies ahead. At least for my family, the decision to start a new life in Ingersoll was something that we chose and that as a family, we believed that God was leading us. Others, possibly you, have gone through dramatic life events and have been forced to start over without wanting to. Maybe a loss of a spouse or loved one through either divorce or death. The loss of a job and the hope that a new community would bring new opportunities. Oppressive situations of abuse and persecution where we feel like we flee like refugees. And I'm sure many of you have stories from your own life that might be even too painful to talk about. When we start over in life, whether something we embrace or it's forced upon us, the new life is kind of foreign to us. And we can feel like a stranger living in a foreign land. The comfortable support systems in your life have been eliminated. And you feel like you're in exile, living in a foreign land far away from your home. Peter, one of the first followers of Jesus, 
speaks of Christians as exiles, strangers in the world. <clears throat> the word Peter uses for exile can be translated as stranger in the sense of a person not belonging, a sojourner, a temporary resident or guest, an alien. Isn't that a weird word, huh? We use it, resident alien, refugee, and even a vagabond who is a wanderer from, who wanders from place to place with no home. I was reflecting this past week how Peter himself went through many startovers in his life following Jesus. Peter was a fisherman by trade when he was first called to follow Jesus. Jesus called Peter to come and become fishers of men. Peter left that career path and began a two-year journey, becoming a part of Jesus' inner circle. Peter's life was transformed radically in that time, following Jesus, even watching Jesus raise his own mother-in-law from the dead. Peter, as with many followers of Jesus at that time, believed that Jesus was the Messiah who would free the Jewish people from the Roman occupation, only to watch his dream shattered as he watched Jesus die crucified on the cross. Remember, it was Peter who took out a sword and cut off a soldier's ear when the authorities came to rest Jesus. Peter then, of course, probably in what he would say, I don't know, the biggest failure of his life, denied even being associated with Jesus publicly by denying him three times. After the resurrection, though, of Jesus, Jesus, by his grace, reinstated Peter to be a leader in the church. And then John 21 paints a picture that Jesus informs Peter that when he's older, someone else will have to dress him and lead him where he won't want to go. And then what does he say? Follow me. Jesus called Peter to follow him wherever Jesus is willing to go. And Peter must follow being led by God's hand. The same Peter then, who had cut off the ear of a soldier's ear when the soldiers came to arrest Jesus, is called by God in Acts 10 to share the good news with another soldier, Cornelius and his family. Peter knew what it was like to start over again and God's grace and his plan in his life. Peter starts his letter in 1 Peter by addressing the church as God's elect or chosen people, exiles or strangers in the world. According to Peter, the churches he was writing to are scattered people, long away from home spiritually. The chapter, the church for Peter, follows the example of Jesus in our world. Chapter 1, verse 17, Peter encourages Christians to live our lives in this world as strangers. Peter, in our text today, gives key phrases to the church to understand how God feels about his people and how he wants us to live in, his, in this world. Look at some of the phrases in verse 9. Peter speaks of Christians as a chosen, belonging to God, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, and called out of darkness into God's light. All of these traits Peter uses are Old Testament statements about the people of Israel. In Exodus 19, verses 4 through 6, the text was God speaking to Moses and how and why God set Israel free from slavery in Egypt. He said, You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. 
Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. The same call of God on the Israelites is for Christians to see themselves as God's chosen treasured possession. The word chosen in this passage has the meaning of being chosen when others, like the world we live in, reject us and reject people. Peter speaks of Jesus in this sense, in verse 4. As he says, Jesus was rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious to him. Being in exile for Christ is to realize that we will face rejection from this world. But we don't belong to the world, but to Christ's kingdom. I believe rejection can also mean how we think someone or something will bring us fulfillment and then we suddenly see how it falls short of meeting our hopes. We can feel rejected when life simply doesn't go our way. Peter states that we are a royal priesthood in this world. Do, do rejected people feel like royalty? Peter is saying that though we are exiled or strangers in the world, we are called by God to be a royal priesthood as Exodus 19 spoke. As Christians, we are part of a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. The priests in the Old Testament temple were the only ones allowed in the temple's holy place to make prayers, offerings, and sacrifices for the people. The priestly tribe of Levi was not given land of their own. For Joshua reminds us the Lord was to be their inheritance. The priests were quite separate even among their fellow Israelites. Peter is calling Christians to be God's treasured possession and act like priests among the people where they live. The Lord is our inheritance as we live like exiles among the very people that we are called to serve. We are called to pray for, bring offerings for, and sacrifice for the people we are living among. We are called to be a holy nation, set apart for God's service with God's heavenly kingdom as our inheritance. Christians don't belong to this world, but to God, who has called us out of darkness into his wonderful light. Our motivation to be God's priests comes because we are people who have received God's mercy in our lives. Though we might have been rejected by humanity, we are chosen by God and for God. Peter realizes that we as Christians are aliens, strangers, exiles in the world, <clears throat> constantly tempted with sinful desires even warring inside of us. It's not easy to be a Christian when you fight rejection by the world, and we fight our own battles inside of us as well. Peter spends the rest of his letter speaking on how to be a follower of Jesus when we are living in exile in this world. We'll spend more of that in the series to come. But in verse 12, Peter encourages us that we should live such good lives among those around us that even though they view us as strange, which is stranger in short, or wrongdoing, wrongdoing such as being concerned about having people become Christians, they say, or being judgmental of non-believers. Have you ever thought, as non-believers and feeling judged by Christians, that they're possibly really feeling rejected by us and by God? We all fear rejection. 
If you knew some of my life, the thoughts of my heart, I fear you might reject me. But God chose us as Christians, not because of our goodness, but in mercy, Christ died for the rejected parts of our lives. The goal, Peter states, is that maybe at some point, hopefully, he longs for this, the non-believer will come to glorify God the same way we do for our willingness to love the non-believer with Christ's love, even though they rejected that love initially. Last week, we watched that film in church, When God Left the Building. One impression that I received from the film was how Christians in North America are living in exile in North American culture. We are outsiders now, viewed as strangers or strange, <clears throat> with little revel, 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 I think you get the word, <laughs> <laughs> to everyday life. The once reality of everybody going to church on a Sunday, and few not, is now the opposite with everybody not going to church, and few do. Christian influence on culture is not the dominating influence anymore, just one of the culture options available for people. We are exiles or strangers living in a land where once the majority claimed to follow Christ. Though we might feel rejected by our friends, family, and neighbors, we need to remember we're chosen by God to belong to God. And sense will always be different. Belonging to God's kingdom, we follow Jesus to be priests to those around us, calling out to God on their behalf. C.S. Lewis one of my favorite authors once said, if I find in myself desires which nothing in this world can satisfy, the only logical explanation is that I was made for another world. So exiles in this world unite. We belong to God. God in His grace has not rejected us. God is calling us to follow Him and be a kingdom of priests for all those around us who we call out to God on their behalf. Offer up offerings and sacrifices to God for them so that when our neighbors and friends experience rejection in this life, they can find the grace of Jesus choosing them to be God's people. The grace and love of God is the answer to satisfy our world's fear of rejection. Shall we pray? Lord, we are a people who belong to you. We cast on you, Lord, all our anxi anxieties for the future of St. Paul's and our own lives, our fears of rejection. Our hope, Lord, is in your mighty hand, not in our own wisdom and understanding. We cast on your throne, before your throne, all our loved ones, those who are suffering rejection, those suffering sickness, both in body and mind. We pray for our brothers and sisters worldwide, understanding that many of them are undergoing the same trials that we face, and sometimes even worse. Strengthen us and restore your church with your presence today, Lord Jesus. Great shepherd of our souls, help us to have a vision of your glory that we belong to you and the crown of glory that you will give us as an inheritance that will never fade away. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.